thank you, uh, colleagues. Uh, I firstly call on the Government Chief Whip to propose the arrangements for this evening's business. Chief it is proposed, notwithstanding anything in standing orders, that in relation to the motion re approval of nomination of members of the Government, A, the proceedings on the motion should be brought to a conclusion after one hour and 40 minutes. B, speeches shall be confined to a single round with 10 minutes for each party or group. C, all members may share time. And D, that all shall adjourn on the conclusion of the proceedings. Thank you, Minister Kaliri. Um, now, can I call on the Taoiseach, Deputy Michal Martin, to confirm his appointment by the President as Taoiseach and to move the motion. I beg leave to announce, for the information of the Doyle, that I have informed the President that the Doyle has nominated me to be the Taoiseach and that, appointed, that he has appointed me accordingly. The urgent and ambitious programme for government, which we have agreed, requires a significant reform to the structure of departments as well as a new approach to how we work collectively to deliver for all of the people of our country. Following the formal nomination of members of the government, I will give more detail about these changes and the work we will undertake starting this evening and throughout our term. Tarigim, Gogoen Toig, Doilerden, Leshantishuk, Danim Nu, Nadakti, Sha Alanis, Kanagapa, Egon Uchtaran, Morcholti, Den Realtis. I move that Doilerden approve the nomination by the Taoiseach of the following deputies for appointment by the President to be members of the Government. As Tarnishta and to the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment, Leo Badker. To the Department of Climate Action, Communication Networks and Transport, Eamon Ryan. To the Department of Finance, Haskell Donoghue. To the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, Michael McGrath. To the Department of Foreign Affairs and Defence, Simon Coveney. To the, the Department of Education, Norma Foley. To the Department of Children, Disability, Equality and Integration, Roderick O'Gorman. To the Department of Agriculture and the Marine, Barry Cowan. To the Department of Justice, Helen McEntee. To the Department of Social Protection, Community and Rural Development and the Islands, Heather Humphreys. To the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage, Dara O'Brien. To the Department of Media, Tourism, Arts, Culture, Sports and the Gueltacht, Catherine Martin. To the Department of Health, Stephen Donnelly. To the Department of Higher Education, Innovation and Science, Simon Harris. To the Office of the Attorney General, Paul Gallagher. I also propose to nominate Deputy Derek Kaliri as Minister of State in the Department of the Taoiseach as Government Chief Whip. In the coming week, I will propose further deputies to serve as Ministers of State and outline a series of special responsibilities to be assigned to them. These will be focused on delivering specific priorities. The government which I am nominating will be committed to working together in a new way and with both urgency and ambition. There is no time for quietly settling in. Every minister has a substantial role to play, not just in delivering the commitments for the departments, but also in the government's collective work. The challenges we must overcome are both immediate and in many cases long-standing. They can only be met and overcome if we work together across our responsibilities. There is no question about our first priority, continuing the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic and moving decisively to recover from its devastating social economic and cultural impact. We will immediately begin the work of preparing an investment-led jobs and recovery initiative which will be brought to the dial for approval next month. This will be a whole of government initiative about more than just the enormous task of getting our people back to work. I together with Deputy Leo Vardkar and Deputy Eamon Ryan will lead this process through a special cabinet committee which will begin its work in the coming days. The cabinet committee will have a wider membership. The economic elements of the initiative will directly act to help businesses which continue to struggle 
and move forward with sustainable initiatives to save and create good jobs in every part of our country. No one yet fully understands what the lasting impacts of the, of the pandemic will be, but we know for sure that these impacts spread deeply in every aspect of our families and communities. We must help school children so that they do not fall permanently behind. We must help people to cope with the personal impact of stress and anxiety. We must do everything possible to quickly recognize and decisively respond to groups and communities which show new and unexpected impacts from the pandemic. And of course, we have to continue to implement safe and proportionate actions to limit the virus. The shaping of a fair and inclusive recovery will be our absolute priority from today and until this work is done. But we have also committed ourselves to an ambitious and urgent program which will define our work from today onwards and in the coming years. Ireland can achieve very little without a strong and dynamic economy. And to have a strong and dynamic economy, we must continue to transform it. We must have sustainable investment in good public services, in preparing the workers and businesses of today and the future for technological change. And we must play our part in tackling the existential crisis of climate change. In support of our programme to meet these economic challenges, we will be restructuring key elements of government. The Departments of Finance and Public Expenditure and Reform will be led by separate cabinet ministers. Together, the ministers will lead action on a wide range of strategies for investment, for reform, and for making sure that Ireland play a leading, plays a leading role in shaping fundamental economic policies under discussion within the European Union and internationally. Deputy Leo Varadkar will lead the restructured Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment with its urgent agenda. The transfer of trade to the department reflects the fact that the next few years will be unique in terms of the number and importance of the trade issues which will be decided. This requires an integrated approach. Equally, it is a statement by the new government that Ireland believes that international trade is essential for helping countries to prosper. It has been central to our progress in the past half century, and it will continue to be central to our progress in the years ahead. All three parties in this new government believe that climate change is a defining challenge, not just of this generation, but of human history. The programme we have agreed puts action on climate change into the work of every part of government. We must not just overcome this challenge, but we must turn it into a new opportunity. We must build an Ireland with a sustainable economy, an Ireland which protects and restores its wonderful natural diversity, and an Ireland which does not leave communities behind in this great transition. Deputy Eamon Ryan will lead this work through a major new portfolio. In addition to climate change and the natural environment, he will oversee other specific areas which are an essential part of the wider climate change agenda. This includes the Department of Transport as well as communications, communication networks. Deputy Hildegard Nochten will be the minister covering international uh, and, road, and road transport and logistics. Agriculture, food and the marine will remain a priority both as central to rural society and a major economic pillar. I reject the false idea that you can either support agriculture or care for the environment. Farmers are the great custodians of our countryside. We owe it to them to work with them to ensure decent incomes and a sustainable future for them and our rural communities as a whole. I can confirm that Senator Pippa Hackett will be appointed as Minister of State in the Department of Agriculture. This new government is determined that Ireland will be a constructive and effective member of the European Union and the international community. In the many struggles underway, in our world, there is no doubt where we stand. We stand for strong international cooperation. We stand for humanitarian principles. We stand for a Europe which is stronger and has the ability to fulfill the great challenges we face. We stand with those who share our belief in free democracy and strong rules-based international organizations. Deputy Simon Coveney will serve as Minister for Foreign Affairs and also as Minister for Defence. He will do so in a challenging period 
during which we will carry the additional responsibility of membership of the Security Council of the United Nations. Our international standing rests on many things, but nothing is more important than the tradition of peacekeeping which our defence forces have built over six decades. Oglig na Herden have served and protected our country with great honour and distinction. 86 of their personnel gave their lives, showing the world the values of our country. The new government is committed to renewing our commitment to Oglig na Herden. Deputy Coveney will ensure that their voice is heard, not just here, but in shaping the humanitarian policies which they will continue to serve. We are also committed to completing the work of reforming policing and ensuring that communities are safe. The Good Friday Agreement remains the defining blueprint for our island's future and a vindication of democratic politics. The new government will move forward quickly to try to fulfil the vision set out in the agreement. We will work closely with the democratic institutions in Northern Ireland. I will establish within the Department of the Taoiseach a new shared island unit which will begin a renewed push to use the potential of the agreement to deliver sustained progress for all communities. And we will do everything to seek the full implementation of the agreements made by the United Kingdom with the European Union concerning Brexit. Helping businesses and communities to prosper in spite of the impact of Brexit is an urgent and ongoing task for us. This government will work to deliver early and sustained action on housing. We are determined to restore hope to people that they will be able to find a place to buy or rent. There are no easy answers. Action and investment is required across a wide range of measures. We're also committed to delivering a public health service which will care for people faster and to the highest standards. We will focus not just on long-term changes, but also on immediate action on the most urgent issues. As we have all seen in recent months, we have a great national resource in the skills and professionalism of those who work in our health service. I have no doubt that we can achieve sustained progress on long-standing problems. The single most important decision in delivering progress for modern Ireland involved a decisive move towards expanding educational opportunity. The new government is committed to delivering further progress on education and is implementing, implementing the most significant modern reform in the structure of how government oversees this area. The higher education sector will form the core of a new separate government department and be combined with other science and innovation functions, including the area of science funding. This sector is going through a major transformation and needs clarity and engagement from government. Equally, we need to do more to acknowledge and build on the incredible base of scientific research which has developed in the past two decades and which has played a central role in our economy and our ability to respond to the pandemic. The Department of Education will implement a series of measures to make education more inclusive and to complete important reforms. Education welfare func functions and school completion uh, service will be returned to that department. We will expand the work of the current Department of Children in a number of important ways. The vital task of improving child protection services and expanding childcare provision will be accelerated. Coordination of disability related issues will be handled by a senior minister for the first time. One of the greatest developments in our recent history is how we are becoming a more diverse society. History teaches us that in the long term, you have to work hard to achieve a successfully integrated society which respects the culture of all. Cabinet level responsibility for integration demonstrates our commitment to undertaking this work. Today would normally be the most colourful and joyful day of the year on the streets of Dublin. Pride is a reminder of just how far we can come in a generation through valuing equality, incorporating it in our laws and changing how we behave towards others. Equality will have a strong voice in this new government. A free, a free, independent 
and professional media is vital for our democracy. We have set our commitment out our commitment to helping not just our public service media, but our professional media as a whole to be able to have a sustainable future. Deputy Catherine Martin will lead our work on this as a matter of urgency. She will also lead the critical work of helping to restart and strengthen key elements of what make us unique as a nation. Our arts, our Dangana Shunta, our sports and our tourism. Thank Catherine Fragra as on 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 capital shinagus tofer suntas of newas so realtas daim new and strategic fad termacht on grailing the side and tanga agus spraga olish at this moment more than ever we've been reminded of the central role which the state must play in supporting people at key moments of their lives and providing them with security including during their retirement the social vision of the new government includes giving a new impetus to community development. This is a major reconfiguration of central elements of how government is structured and it will be accompanied with a new approach to how government works. Ministers and their officials will work more closely together in a series of cabinet committees which will be established. The challenges our country is facing cannot be placed within the walls of individual departments. They cut across government and we must work across normal boundaries to overcome these challenges decisive and rapid action on recovery <clears throat> immediate and ongoing work to address the central challenges of housing health education brexit and climate change and a positive and outward looking engagement with europe and the international community these are the principles which will underpin our work our country has achieved many incredible things in the past and i have no doubt that we can and will do so again Thank you very much, Taoiseach. I take it that the arrangements as set out by the Government Chief Whip are acceptable to the House. They are? Agreed. Thank you. Can I call then on the spokesperson for Fine Gael to address the House? You have uh, 10 minutes. Honishta. Kian Corla, today we broke a tradition by electing a new Taoiseach in government in this centre rather than Leinster House. We found a new way of doing things without sacrificing any of the things that really matter. So let this symbolize the mission of this new government, putting aside the divisions of the past and to find new ways of doing things, a new approach that is in the best interests of our country, a break with the past for the dream of a better future. I want to offer my sincere congratulations to Michal Martin on his election as Taoiseach. This is a special day for him, for his family, for the Fianna Fáil party, and a day that will be celebrated by many people, not least by the banks of the lovely Lee. I want to especially mention one person, his wife Mary, who has been alongside him for all of his political career, through the worst of times, as well as the best. Today is your day as much as it is the Taoiseach's, and I hope that you and your family enjoy it. The unique circumstances of today's meeting of the Dáil mean that, unfortunately, there is not the usual gathering of family, friends and supporters, but they are here in spirit for this occasion. I offer my warm words of congratulation, not simply because my party, Fine Gael, supported this election. It is right that we wish a new Taoiseach well when they start out, whatever their political persuasion, because when a new Taoiseach does well, our country does well too. Today is not a day for rancor or point scoring, but to mark a new beginning. When I first became a TD back in 2007, I was then my party spokesperson for a department called Enterprise Trade and Employment. And I enjoyed many robust exchanges with the Minister of the Day. These exchanges continued over the years across the different positions we held. And for the last three years, that was twice a week during leaders' questions. From today, we'll, we'll be working together in government. We're very different people, but we have some crucial things in common. One of them is a determination to do what we can to better the lives of, our, of the people of our country. And I look forward to working together in partnership over the next five years. I also want to congratulate Minister Ryan and the Green Party on their return to government. What an extraordinary comeback. 
like the Taoiseach, Minister Ryan became leader of a party in 2011 that was on its knees. No TDs, little public support, and questions being asked about its future. Today, the Green Party is helping to shape our future for the better. And I know from the negotiations that this is definitely a party that knows how to play senior hurling. During the debate on ratifying the programme for government, I was impressed by the passion, the vision and determination of the members of the Green Party. The intensity of the internal debate reflected a seriousness about the issues and did credit to everyone on all sides. And I congratulate the new ministers on their appointment and look forward to working with the Green Party to deliver real and lasting change for the benefit of our country and our world. For my own party, this is a, an historic day as we enter our third consecutive government, something we're doing for the first time. On a personal level, it is of course tinged with real sadness to see so many friends and colleagues leave office. When we met before we came over here, we were just seven. It seemed like the room was empty. I know the Fine Gael ministers appointed today will serve our country to the very best of their ability, working to build a better future in the best traditions of our party. I also want to pay tribute to those who are no longer ministers, but served our country faithfully and courageously over the past few years, and also pay tribute to their staff. People often forget that behind every politician, behind every minister, there are advisors and support staff, many of whom will be made redundant in the next few days. I am honored to be appointed Taunashtan Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Employment, and I look forward to taking up a new role with new responsibilities. But today is not a day for celebration for Fine Gael, far from it. We're doing what is right for the country, but it comes at a cost. A gobru in Ainnacht le Fianna Fáil agus party glas is Faderling Ternev Gallagrach Ardira Astura, Pusht agus Rahunas a Hort Arash, Dunanlek le Turhi an Fandema, agus Ganivu er Ahru Eroida, a Tauriatanach con Ardir agus ar Blanaid a Quivnu. Ciancorla, our country has been through a terrible emergency where many people have lost their lives and more have had to live with illness and fear of illness. Jobs have been lost, businesses destroyed, and our economy upended. Across the world, countries have been badly affected by COVID-19, and across the world, countries are being affected by the consequences of climate breakdown. This government will take the transformative action required to rebuild what has been swept away, repair what has been damaged, and renew what has been lost. The mission of this new government is therefore a simple one. We seek to be a government of action that will deliver the kind of change that people demanded in the last election. A change not defined by one party, but rather defined by the policies, priorities, and actions we take as a new government. Can Corla, we seek to be a government of enterprise, creating jobs and preparing for the jobs and workplaces of the new future, driving our economic recovery and improving quality of life for all of our people. We seek to be a government of engagement, engaging with our own citizens and with countries around the world at the heart of the European Union and offering leadership in the United Nations. Our parties have very different histories, very different temperaments, but we're united by determination to help Ireland to recover and thrive. We have respect for each other's policies, beliefs and values, and we'll work through any differences that arise for the greater good. Jan Corla, this government must hit the ground running starting today. We must get places reopened and people back to work and repair what has been damaged. Next month, we'll unveil the July stimulus to kickstart our economy. Its recovery fund will be targeted to increase domestic demand and employment and deliver a balanced regional growth. I believe we have the opportunity to drive strategic change through our small and medium enterprises, accelerate job creation, decarbonize the economy, ensure that Ireland is at the forefront of the digital future, and bring about a more equal economy for all. In autumn, 
around budget time, we'll produce our national economic plan, a far-reaching long-term vision to restore full employment. It will show how we can secure our public finances in a world where we must live with COVID-19, and also drive our efforts to decarbonize economy and prepare for the next phases of technological transformation. We do not have any time to waste, and we must act now. Count Corla, over the past few months, when things were at their worst, we saw our country and its people at their best. We faced massive challenges, but today is a day of new beginnings, and therefore is one of hope for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tonish. Minister Eamon Ryan. Thank you, Concorla. It's a very great honour to be part of the acting out of our constitution here today in appointing a Taoiseach and being part of a cabinet appointed by that Taoiseach is the greatest honour in our democratic constitutional re republic and we seek to live up to that as best we can. Um, I I'm reminded by this, central to this is the the pivotal role of a cabinet in the Irish constitution and in Irish political decision making. We do operate a system which has collective cabinet responsibility. And that brings also collective cabinet authority, that we do have a tradition here. I, I may be proved wrong on this, but my understanding is that there's never been really a vote in the Irish cabinet. You don't vote yes or no on issues. If something has come to government, you do a lot of work of that in advance. And three things can happen. It can be accepted, it can be amended, or it can be re you can decide to revert back to it again so that the issue is resolved. And I think that system gives us great strength. I think that sense of common collective ability in a cabinet to come to a con con conclusion, while sometimes can be difficult, leads to good decision making. And I think we commit our party to work, to work with the other two parties in a really trusting way to make that work on behalf of our people, particularly because we are in such a difficult time. We are in the midst of a crisis that we have not seen. In terms of how we should approach that, maybe it's interesting in my mind to look back, if I could look back in the history of our state very briefly, to look at maybe lessons from the past that we could try and apply to this government and to this cabinet and the wider uh, junior ministers, would they come, come on board, and indeed the wider doll and Shannad, when they uh, engage in this process as it unfolds in the next four to five years. I think we should look to some of our successes in the past. I think we should look to the strategic decisions that were made in the early part of the last decade, when we decided to actually invest in science, to invest in Science Foundation Ireland, invest in research, invest in becoming good at a country in how we do things like digital technologies or medical devices or other, the new advanced economies or new advanced technologies which were coming. That was a strategic decision then made by politicians, implemented by public servants, lived out in the daily lives of hundreds of thousands of Irish people who took part in the transformation that saw our economy, our society, becoming a remarkably successful in advanced manufacturing and advanced services and in technology. And we should keep with that path. We should actually double down and I think to try and improve and become even better at it in thinking what's the new technology changes, what's the new investments. And I think some of the departments that have been set up here that really are aimed at innovation and try encouraging or bringing that connection together between our academic community, our business community, our, our, our civil society and government is going to be pivotal to the success of this country. Being willing to risk things, being willing to make mistakes, being willing to fail is the only way we, we will succeed because we will learn lessons from those things that don't work and when those things that do, we can multiply them and, and roll them out. So that first task, I think that lesson for being open to innovation and to invest in innovation in our education systems and in a state that is willing to be enterprising, a state that is willing to take risks, a state that will not hammer a public servant if they make a creative decision and it may go wrong because we will learn from that. The second lesson in my lifetime in terms of how you get out of a crisis in my mind comes from the late 80s. 
we'd gone through a very long and deep recession through the 1980s, and I, the history books will give various versions of what happened, even down culturally, some of those, you know, beating the English in the, in the European Championships or other, Mo, Mary Robinson calling people to dance with her, various things lifted our spirits. But I think central to the recovery of that time was a partnership, a social partnership, right down to the community level. Coming from the National Economic and Social Council and other people, again, politicians at the time, to invest in community development, to invest in community leadership, invest in community as a way of helping poverty eradication, building up community leaders. It wasn't all the state doing it, it was the state facilitating communities to come out of bad times, and it worked. And we were good at it. I think we were used, seen in Europe as some of the best examples in how leader programs work, to how community enterprise schemes work. I, I set up a small business from a community enterprise learning scheme myself, called Tommy Simpson down in Cabra, helping me up in those first days of getting a business going. That community approach really worked, and I think throughout this government, in every single department, we should be looking to put a community of focus on things, encouraging a bottom-up, not just the state doing everything for people, but facilitating community groups to thrive. We lost some of that orientation in the last decade. It's time to bring it back at scale everywhere. And the third lesson from before my time is how you actually change strategic direction. And I believe it comes from that period when the likes of Whitaker and Lamas, public service and politicians and others, turned Ireland from being a closed economy to being an open economy, which brought actually a lot of our success. It came because there was broad political agreement at the time, again, becoming at a time in the late 50s of real crisis, where we had mass emigration, mass unemployment, widespread poverty, and there was an agreement we had to change. And in that agreement, which lasted 20 or 30 years, we were able to make strategic decisions that helped us get, change our path to becoming this open country to the world. Collective agreement around um, investment in education, joining the European Union, being good at foreign direct investment. It took 20 or 30 years for the rewards for that consistency to come through, but it did work for us as a country. And I think we need to do the same today. Collective agreements that were going to move from an unsustainable model of, economic, of the economy to a sustainable, that we are going to go green. And we can do that with confidence because I believe most parties in this House actually do agree with that. Most parties, whether left or right or whatever their position, actually, and independents, I think, actually think, because they think they realise Irish people think, yeah, we're going to be good at this and it's time for us to do it. So we are well placed <coughs> to make that strategic change. And we're well placed because Europe is doing the same with the European Green Deal, and we know this is where the new economy is going, so therefore this is where innovation is going. And more than anything else, we know that it won't work if it isn't community first, if it's not from the bottom up, with community energy and agreement on how we improve and updo our, do our houses and building thing, public transport and safe routes to schools and other things that help us build community as well as cutting out the carbon in our society creating a local environment that's healthy in every way. So we set about this with pride on a weekend when the Pride Parade would have gone outside along the quays here. People in Dublin will know it. It's an incredible occasion. It gives you pride in your own country. And we should be a government that adopts that as our approach, welcoming diversity, being open, being creative, doing whatever we can to get this country out of a deep recession, using some lessons from the past, but facing the future in a way that serves our country with pride. That's what we seek to do. Thank you, Concorla. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Ryan. Uh, Deputy Mary Lou MacDonald, please. Gramagut, uh, Concorla. And can I begin by extending my good wishes to Antishuk? Uh, Deputy Muhal Martin, I have no doubt, uh, Thishuk, this is a very proud day for you, for your people, uh, for your community. Uh, and can I extend also good wishes to all those who have now been appointed to ministerial office because no doubt this is uh, a cause for celebration for, for all of you. Uh, Count Corla, in February last, we, we presented a manifesto for change to the people and we asked them to give us a chance 
to deliver that change, to lead. The people, by way of response, gave us a record mandate, and that was a mandate to enter government, and that was not to be on this occasion. But nonetheless, we have witnessed a realignment of Irish politics, and Sinn Féin, for the first time, will now lead the opposition, and Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael have for formally come together. The widespread expectation that a change election would be followed by the formation of a new government, a government that could deliver the new politics that people are crying out for wasn't to be because the century-old impulse to grab power, to maintain the old political order, to push back against the instinct and energy for change so powerfully demonstrated at the ballot box through Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael together. And so the truth is they have coalesced and they have colluded in frustrating the voice of change. And you know, Ceann Corla, excluding the representatives of more than half a million citizens is nothing to be proud of in my book. I don't think it's something that any Democrat should boast about. Indeed, succeeding in stalling or stopping necessary change is really no success at all. It's the mark of narrow, failed politics of the past. And that narrow kind of thinking is reflected in your unambitious programme for government. This will be a government of more of the same. Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael in government is no historical departure. However, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael forced into a loveless embrace by the hopeful vote of the people. Well, that now is the historical point of departure for your government. Some have described this as the end of so-called civil war politics. The reality is that Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael today have precious little to do with anything that was at issue in that tragic conflict. The words of Liam Mallows, a patriot himself executed by the Free State, in his speech against the treaty, I think ring very true today. Here's what he said. He said, men will hold power. And men who get into positions and hold power will desire to remain undisturbed and will not want to be removed. So for decades, the issue between Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil was supposedly Maria about civil war issues. But in reality, the ancient quarrel between Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael has long since descended into a race for power and for privilege in this state. Forgotten, abandoned in all of this, were those who suffered most from the partition of our country, the people of the six counties. Forgotten and abandoned was any plan to achieve full democracy, self-determination and unity for Ireland. And so, the great national project of reunification is not included in your programme for government. Not a whisper from your government, while this conversation about constitutional change happens all across our island. And I think this is especially concerning during the age of Brexit, when the imperative to protect the Good Friday Agreement in all of its parts has never been greater. A united Ireland is the very best idea for the future of our country. It's essential to the prosperity of all our people, because growing our economy requires an all-Ireland approach. Protecting our health services requires an all-Ireland approach. Getting ahead of COVID-19, protecting public health, protecting our people's health requires an all-Ireland approach. And no government, not least an incoming government in this period, should ignore the imperative of unity. It should be Taoiseach planning for change, planning for reunification, and planning for that referendum on Irish unity as per the Good Friday Agreement. Count Corlew, the society shaped by the old establishment divides us between the haves and the have-nots, the insiders and the outsiders, the entitled and the rest. And that's why government after government has presided over a housing crisis. It's an indictment of successive governments that housing is so unaffordable for so many. 
It's also why our health system is broken, crippled by hospital overcrowding, a never-ending trolley crisis and record-breaking treatment waiting lists. It's also why the principle of fairness is breached day and daily in every aspect of Irish life. The Ireland of Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael is a place where 65-year-olds can't retire in dignity with their state pension. It's one where working parents can't afford childcare, where educational disadvantage is all too prevalent, where citizens living with disabilities and their carers are forgotten, and where those, those with mental health challenges are left to fend for themselves. And none of this is accidental. All of this is the consequence of bad politics. It's why governments come and governments go, but nothing really changes. Irish politics is broken, and the way of fixing it is by heeding the people's demand for change. The people know this, and they've said in record numbers that the time for change is now, and people are ready for a fresh start. Those who drafted your programme for government, I feel, must live in a different reality to the rest of us. The crisis in housing and healthcare dominated the election, and the crisis in both has deepened during the COVID crisis. And on top of that, many families are now facing what has been described as a tsunami of debt, as insurance companies were allowed to continue their rip-off, as banks charged interest to 80,000 families who had to take a mortgage break. So people need homes that they can afford. So Taoiseach and new government build the affordable homes and make sure that they are actually affordable in the real world. They need to be able to see a doctor when they're sick. So invest in public hospitals and our public system. End the privatisation agenda. What is proposed in your plan, far from tackling these challenges, will only, I believe, deepen our problems. And the issues that mattered most to ordinary people in the course of the election are dodged or fudged. But you have, however, managed to include tax breaks for those at the top in your programme. Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil from the get-go have copped out on delivering common sense solutions for workers and families. The brief enlightenment which we saw uh, turn to more progressive decisions during the COVID-19 emergency has been extinguished by your programme for government. For Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, fairness can only ever be a temporary thing, you see, a reaction rather than a principle of good government. And because of your lack of ambition, this is a government already on borrowed time. And workers and families know that they deserve so much better. And it's that belief that will drive Sinn Féin's determination to deliver effective opposition. We have the policies, Ceann Corla. We have the team. Piers Doherty has the plan to shape a fair economy. Louise O'Reilly for a national health service. Owen O'Brien has the plan to make housing affordable. We are happy to share those plans with you. And if you are serious about tackling these issues, you will work with those plans. I'm very proud to lead our team of 37 TDs, a team committed to realising a changed Ireland, a fair Ireland and a united Ireland. And we will stand up for all of those who voted for change. We'll work hard for them and it is in their name that we will hold your government to account. Um, thank you very much, Deputy MacDonald. We move now to the Labour Party, and Deputy Alan Kelly. Uh, thank you, Cahirlach. I am sharing time with Deputy Aon uh, Firstly, uh, I want to formally congratulate you, Taoiseach, on your appointment. Uh, it's an extremely special day, and particularly for your wife, Mary, and your children, your wider family, and definitely your community. And from your contribution earlier, I can feel from the emotion in your voice how important your community is. Uh, so I'm sure you're looking forward to getting back amongst them uh, in the coming days. And I wish you well in that, um, sincerely. Um, uh, I know you bring huge experience to the role, um, given 
uh, the length of time you served in the various different ministries. And I have to say, I for one, I'm somebody who very much admires uh, the legislation you brought in in 2004 in relation to the smoking ban. I think it changed an awful lot of uh, health issues and social issues in Ireland. It changed the way of thinking and was very formative and ahead of its time. Uh, so more of that thinking uh, will be really appreciated in these difficult times. I know you have a special uh, interest in education as well. Um, you, like myself, come from a, unlike your predecessor, come from a, a public uh, school background. Indeed, uh, I think we're in a minority because um, your predecessor, the leader of Sinn Féin, the leader of People Before Profit, the leader of RISE, they all come from the private side. So I'm glad that you come from the public side because it actually will influence, hopefully, and, uh, and increase the interest in education. And I know the uh, two government ministers also shows that there is a determination there. So I very much welcome that. I also just want to, because I couldn't earlier, acknowledge uh, the outgoing uh, Taoiseach and Corinne Tánaiste, who I look forward to working with. He's somebody, obviously, I've worked with quite closely in the past. Um, I haven't often agreed with him. I have agreed with him on other occasions, but he's somebody who's always been very uh, direct and straight uh, and easy to deal with, so I wish him uh, well in the challenges ahead of him. I also want to wish all the new ministers uh, the best of luck in all of your portfolios, many of which I know very well, um, and some which I don't know that well, or my colleagues don't know that well. Uh, but I can assure you, we're going to get to know you very, very well in the coming uh, months and probably years. Um, COVID has caused this uh, country extraordinary pain and suffering. However, in a political sense, uh, Taoiseach, uh, it creates opportunities because it has been a disruptor. So I'm asking you to use it. In health, why limit free GP care to under 12s? Why don't you just go and give universal care? It's laundry care. We need public beds quickly. We need to build hospitals. But in the interim, let's nationalize one of the private hospitals. Radically introduce profound changes in education across primary and third level, something you have a deep interest in. Why not fast forward some of the ambitions around climate change that are labor intensive, thereby pushing shovel ready projects and employment. In relation to jobs, the stimulus, it has to concentrate on key areas like tourism. And I've already said, that this program for government is weak on workers' rights. So I'm asking very clearly, because I think it now comes under the Tonishta's area of responsibility, that there is an immediate priority in this government that they must appeal to the Supreme Court, the recent High Court decision on sectoral employment orders, that protect tens of thousands of ordinary low-paid workers in many areas of this country, in many sectors. It is, if it's necessary to bring in emergency legislation, let's just do that. In fact, we will make it easier for you. My colleague, Jed Nash, who inspired these orders in the first place through legislation, has it written up. So please, please look at that. I want to just raise a couple of issues in the minute or so I have remaining. It is, and this is speculation, uh, Taoiseach, it is speculated that you're going to appoint 20 junior ministers. This would be your first mistake. I and some others here was a member of a government during very difficult times where 15 junior ministers were appointed. That was plenty. There were no ministerial advisors either. I don't think the taxpayers of Ireland would appreciate in this difficult time such lavish and indulgent behavior. And I'm sure when you reflect, you'll agree. I also understand that Obviously, you're rotating with the Taunishta, the Minister for Finance is rotating with the Minister for Public Expenditure. I hear the Cahir Lachlis Shannon is rotating as well, but also the AG is rotating. That is not good practice. To have an Attorney General rotating in the middle because of political preference isn't right. And also, it will not lead to good, consistent interpretation of legislation and the needs of government or indeed the Houses of Eurotus. I brought in rent freezes, which others said were unconstitutional, but yet all of a sudden, in the COVID crisis, were constitutional. We need consistency. And finally, in relation to government departments, there's a whole load of issues here and questions I have, but one is glaring. We have a new government, and congratulations to everybody, and congratulations in particular to the Green Party for being part of it. But there is nowhere mentioned 
and anywhere a minister for environment. So who has the responsibilities for environment and planning? Who is responsible for all the wider areas of environment outside of climate change, particularly who is in charge, for instance, of the EPA and all other planning uh, reform, etc.? Thank you. Deputy O'Rear John, you have four minutes. Uh, we meet. It almost feels like a, a wartime government has just been assembled. Uh, and we meet here because 1,700 people have lost their lives as a result of, of a virus that has hit our country. And so I think that should remind us all of the collective endeavor we have uh, to beat this virus and to return the country to some level of normality. You know, politics can be a harsh business. It can be quite personal at times. And I think in that environment, I think what the country needs is to see politics working better. And that's why it's disappointing to hear phrases such as betrayal and even to hear the word hatred being mentioned earlier today. So what my party is trying to do is trying to achieve is not to trade in, in hatred, not to trade in division, but to oppose elements of what government does which we feel is wrong and to support elements of what the government does which we feel is right. I want to turn the minds of Dáil Éireann today to where we are and to the words of Thomas Johnson who said almost well, over 100 years ago when he wrote in the first programme of the first Dáil in 1919, it shall be the first duty of the government of the Republic to make provision for the physical, mental and spiritual well-being of the children, to ensure that no child should suffer, suffer hunger or cold from lack of food, clothing or shelter. We are in the north inner city of Dublin. And the great thing that has liberated those who have been disadvantaged in this country has been education. But what has enslaved disadvantaged communities has been inequality and drugs. Now this government proposes two citizens' assemblies, one on education and one on drugs. And I will say this and my party will say this. If you are genuinely radically going to overhaul the education system, if you're going to treat the 17.9% of Irish adults who are functionally illiterate as a scandal, if you're going to realise that 30% of children who leave disadvantaged schools have basic reading problems, if you are to understand that the difference between one three-year-old and another three-year-old is 66% in a differential in their oral language capacity, and if you want to tackle all those issues in your education citizens' assembly, then we will work with you and we will support you because we believe that education is the great liberator. But what has enslaved working class communities and the drugs issue goes right throughout this land is the issue of, of addiction and the criminalization of those in addiction. So let's treat the drugs crisis as a health issue and that we use the resources of the state to tackle the, 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 the drug gangs and not those who suffer from what they do. So if that is your endeavour, we will disagree on tax, we will disagree on the role of the state, we will disagree on the size of the state, and we will disagree on many things. But if your endeavour is to eradicate educational disadvantage, to eradicate illiteracy, and for a radical change in drug policy, then in those areas you will get agreement from the Labour Party. Because it actually isn't about talking about betrayal or about being hated. It's actually about making politics work for people. And there's so much we can achieve in these, these houses of the Oireachtas if we put aside the pre-written scripts and actually do something for the people who sent us here. Garv Mahagut, our next speaker is Deputy Roisin Shartog, co-leader of the Social Democrats. Uh, thank you, Cahir uh, Luck. At the outside, uh, Taoiseach, I would like to congratulate you. Uh, I think the idea of Taoiseach Michal Martin will take a bit of getting used to, but on a personal note, uh, I want to wish you well. 
uh, you've waited for this for a long time and uh, there's no doubt that today must be a very proud day for you and your family. I also congratulate uh, the cabinet ministers who have been appointed today. The election of a three-party coalition government is taking place in what are the most inauspicious of circumstances. As a result of COVID-19, the country is going through a devastating period with tragically 1,736 people who have lost their lives. Hundreds of thousands of people have lost their livelihoods and countless lives have been changed forever. Worldwide, we must remind ourselves that we are still in the midst of a deadly pandemic. And here in Ireland, we must recognise that it remains a real and ever-present danger. I want to take this opportunity to thank our Chief Medical Officer, Dr Tony Holohan, and all of those working on the front line, uh, particularly in the health area, but across retail and all of those other essential services. People who have done exceptional work over recent months and who continue to do that work on behalf of us all. I also want to acknowledge the public who have adhered magnificently to the advice, despite having lost loved ones, lost jobs, and made so many huge sacrifices over recent months. However, today we must recognise that in February's election, the electorate roundly rejected the kind of politics provided by the outgoing government of Fine Gael, supported by Fianna Fáil. Rarely before had people been so exercised by and so conversant with government policy and the harmful negative effects much of it was having on their quality of life and that of their families. People had enough of the high cost of living and the difficulty in accessing those public services which are so essential to living a decent life. On top of that, there is the raft of other charges and costs such as insurance, energy costs, mortgage interest, costs that the government had failed to control. And all of this in the context of 25% of the workforce on low pay and in an increasingly precarious and insecure world of work. But you know, the cruel irony is that the very people who created those problems are today now back in power. During the election, the most common response on the doorsteps to the question of who people would be voting for was, well, not Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael anyway. And when the votes were counted, those once large parties, the civil war parties, mustered just 43% of the vote between them. People voted predominantly for a different kind of politics. They voted for a new approach and a different value system or ideology. The general election result strongly signified the desire of the Irish people for a fundamental shift towards a more equal, fairer and more inclusive society. In mid-April, as the pandemic had taken hold, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael agreed a framework document. It contained many worthy aspirations and in an apparent candid admission of mistakes made, they made a remarkable statement. They said, we know that there is no going back to the old ways of doing things. Radical actions have been taken to protect as many people as possible, and new ways of doing things have been found in a time of crisis. The importance of a well-resourced, properly functioning and responsive state has never been clearer, they said. And for a moment, we actually thought that lessons had been learned, that the penny had finally dropped, and that there was a realisation that a strong state is critical to the well-being of a society and to people's lives. Because when the pandemic struck, the frailties of our state were all too graphically exposed. Our under-resourced public health service was nowhere near enough staff or hospital beds. Our arm's length privatised model of social care. The prevalence of low paid, low hours work with limited rights and protections. Our disjointed, 
underfunded, mainly for profit childcare services, high rents and lack of security for so many tenants, overcrowded and overpriced housing, inhumane conditions in direct provision, and so many other weaknesses. In responding to COVID, the government moved to socialise many of these essential public services because that was the only way that we would survive. And initially, it did seem like the government was serious about radical change. However, very soon it became clear that Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael fully intended going back to the old ways of doing things as soon as COVID was brought under control. But people had voted for permanent change, for a genuine social contract where people pay taxes according to their means and in return have access to universal public services and where government works for the common good. But that was never the Fine Gael way. Fine Gael operates on the basis that the market is king and that if you can't afford to pay for services, services that are available as of right in most other European countries, then it's tough luck and you don't get access to essential services. And that is, the one, of, and that is one of the reasons why, when Fine Gael approached the Social Democrats with a view to coalition, we knew that they were not going to change their spots. It was clear that while Fine Gael talked the talk of inclusion and public services, there was no financial underpinning at all to the aspirations. And so it is with the programme for government. Continued reliance on developers and for the elusive affordable housing that we've been promised so often. And another 18 months of free reign and poor planning standards with strategic housing developments. Supposedly accelerating Sláinte Care, but without any budget till at least 2022. And continuing to divert funding away from the public health care system through the NTPF. No indication of a public model of childcare, no reform of corporation tax or other taxes, and on and on. The lack of any real funding commitment to change runs right through the programme for government. It is clear that following the immediate crisis, the intention is to get back to business as usual. Key questions about the size and duration of the stimulus package needed and the extent of the borrowing required are kicked down the road. Fianna Fáil, on the other hand, had choices about where it would go. They knew very well that the market-led politics of Fine Gael, which they supported for the last four years, had done the country and both parties much damage. Yet when they had the opportunity to make a break with the past, to shift to the left, and lead a genuine social democratic government that people had voted for, they eschewed that opportunity and instead locked themselves into Fine Gael. And that is an utterly retrograde step for the country. I genuinely hope that the Green Party is successful in furthering the climate change and biodiversity agenda. But I have to express concern about that being possible to achieve within the prevailing agenda of Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil. The lack of any commitment to a reduction in carbon emissions in the context of the national herd is reflective of just that challenge. For our part, the expanded Social Democrats group will play a constructive and positive role in this doll. We will fight unapologetically for a fair society based on high quality universal public services and for the kind of politics which challenges the many vested interests in Irish society and holds us back so much. We will provide strong opposition in order to hold the government to account and we will work tirelessly to further the ideals of social democracy in order to create the kind of society which we believe will serve the best interests of all of the Irish people. Thank you, Deputy.
Um, our next speaker is Deputy Smith. I believe you're sharing with Deputies Murphy and Barry. I'm also sharing with Deputy Kenny. There'll be three deputies sharing with me. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I want to start by saying I have absolute confidence in this government and that confidence is based on what we know about the parties in government and what they did in the last decades when they were in power. I'm confident that Fianna Gael will look after the very wealthy in this society. I'm confident that Fianna Fáil will look after the developers and the builders. And I'm very confident that the Greens will act as a mudguard for both of them. We know from recent history that Fianna Fáil and the Greens had no problem punching down when they needed to make cuts. And we know that Fianna, Fáil, Fianna Gael have no problem enriching the 1%. People before profit will make sure that the next all remembers that it remembers those who the last government forgot and those who this government will try to ignore. Working people, the homeless, tenants in rented accommodation, pensioners who've lost out and our older citizens in the nursing homes, to mention but a few. We will bring them into the Dáil every day the Dáil sits, just as this government will bring in the rich, the investors, the bankers, the vulture funds and the lobbyists that they employ. Among those forgotten by the last government, I want to ask a few questions of particular ministers. To the new Minister for Justice, who happens to be female, will you do what the last minister failed to do, and indeed what the last Taoiseach has ignored, and extend the maternity leave and benefit for women who have been affected by the COVID crisis? And will you end the flagrant injustice visited on the O'Farrell family, and commission the independent inquiry into the death of Shane O'Farrell, as voted for in the last all? To the new Minister for Education, will you act on the recommendation of the Committee on the Eighth Amendment and ensure that young people receive a non-ethos-based sex education? To the new Minister for Trade and Employment and former Taoiseach, I too am calling you to act without haste and to save the sexual employment orders threatened by the recent High Court judgment and appeal that decision to ensure that workers in the electoral and construction trade and further workers in security and contract cleaning do not have their wages and their conditions minimised? And will you act now to ensure that workers who are being dumped on the scrap heap, like the Debenhams workers, workers in Upright Ireland and other companies by the Insolvency Act, are put at the top of the list of creditors in those situations? And to the new Minister for Housing, Will you please end the trauma and stress facing many thousands of renters by immediately extending the ban of evictions until at least 2021? And I want to end my contribution by saying this. I want to congratulate the Green Party because they've succeeded in reintroducing the wolves into one habitat. And that's the wolves of Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael austerity back into the government. And that, I hope not, but it may be one of their most prominent achievements. Deputy Murphy. Sorry, Deputy Kenny. Sure. Um, there are times when you have to make a stand, not because it's popular or unpopular, but it's the right thing to do. And the omission of the Occupied Territories Bill from the programme for government was the time to make that stand. The people of Palestine are tired of platitudes from the EU and the international community. Sorry, this has gone a bit. Do you believe that? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do it the manual way. But my appeal is this government, uh, in relation to the Occupied Territories Bill, that it would be passed and legislated for. Uh, the time for platitudes uh, and showing solidarity to the Palestinian people is now. Uh, we've let down the Palestinian people because of the omission of this Occupied Territories Bill, and it's time.